Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back. Yeah, once again, uh, this is Zhao from CGIR, one of your hosts of this event, ICT for Act. Um, today we have another special guest, a special keynote speaker. Uh, we are really honored and very pleased to introduce him. Uh, he is a principal scientist and professor of agri food innovation and transition from University of Tarka and Wageningen University. So, Professor Lawrence Clark, uh, thanks so much for joining us today, um, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I will get my presentation up and running. So, there we go. Well, um, in the first place, thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation. I'm really happy uh, to uh, be speaking to this audience of policymakers, practitioners, and scientists in the field of uh, digital transformation. And my talk uh, will be about um, digital transformation of food systems through mission-oriented agricultural innovation systems. So I will basically talk about, you know, how can we organize uh, digital transformation in a way that is inclusive, that tackles the grand challenges of our time, uh, and that also makes sure that uh, we don't have any effects which are too negative for too many people. Uh, you can never exclude fully that there will be some risks for some people, but you need to mitigate it as much as possible. So as uh, most in the audience will be aware of, uh, there's lots of attention lately in recent years to food systems transformation. Uh, a lot of reports have uh, appeared for example, on socio-technical innovation bundles for agri-food systems transformation, a great report from Chris Barrett and colleagues, which talks about that we really need to bundle technological innovation with social innovation, with market innovation, with policy innovation. The EU also has paid a lot of attention recently to it, uh, also looking at, you know, how can we future-proof our food systems? Uh, World Bank has done a great report in the context of Latin America, looking at what could food, future food systems look like. And there's many more of these types of reports for different regions in the world. And obviously, we've had the United Nations Food Systems Summit in 2021, a follow-up this year. So this is a really uh, actual topic, and we really need to work hard uh, on it because our food systems are under a uh, big threat because of climate change, but are also contributing to climate change, so really need to uh, transform uh, to yeah, make sure that there's uh, good and plenty of food for the whole world population also in the future. So within food systems transformation, uh, digitalization and digital transformation obviously plays a big role. Uh, it's an important technological revolution, which we have seen in recent years. Uh, we are currently witnessing that all kinds of technologies are having a breakthrough. Uh, one could look at robotics, which is becoming much more applied in different sectors. Uh, AI is now very much uh, breaking through. For example, a recent uh, paper by colleagues from the CGR talks about uh, 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 language uh, AI, uh, like ChatGPT for extension services. So all kinds of digital technologies are entering the scene. And this really can radically uh, transform food systems. Uh, we could go to systems in which our farms are managed by robots, are steered by digital twins and AI, where value chains are fully uh, arranged, monitored uh, by digital technologies uh, that can be a really transformative future in which digital technologies play a role. It could also be that they merely, have, um, and that is more an evolution instead of a revolution, um, improve or uh, enhance, make more efficient our current systems uh, so that we will not have fully uh, transformed uh, food systems. But that is still to be seen. Uh, uh, despite all our technologies, we still don't have a fully working crystal ball through which we can predict the future. What is important uh, to uh, recognize is that these different uh, food systems of the future uh, they're not value-free. Uh, um, they have different ideas behind it, different values behind it, different visions behind it. Some people really would love a fully automated farming future in which all the work is done by robots, that the farmer sits in an office, that all the food production, food trade, 
uh, food consumption, food delivery is automated. For some, that is really utopia, whereas for others, this is a total dystopia, a total nightmare. And they say, oh, we are becoming dehumanized, we are becoming monitored, we are becoming surveilled by digital technologies. We don't want that. Uh, so some of these people also say, and we don't think this makes a better uh, agriculture, which is more biodiverse. Uh, we think that digitalization rather enhances uh, monocultures. So there's different views on this. For example, uh, uh, IPES Food really thinks that, that digitalization and digital transformation is not necessarily positive. So it's very important to recognize that there's different sorts of directionality. Where are future food systems heading towards? Uh, what are the innovations doing? What is the purpose of the different innovations? Um, and this is also contemplated in different policy frameworks. So different countries are now uh, defining what do we want our agriculture and food systems to look like in 2030 or 2050. And they put emphasis on different elements. And some put more emphasis on circularity. For example, the Netherlands really wants circular agriculture and food systems. Other countries uh, still say, yeah, we want to improve our food system, but we also want to stay major exporting nations. Others say, no, we want to become more self-sufficient and we want to become more agroecological. Others say we need to connect much more to indigenous worldviews and how uh, they work with intergenerational perspectives on food production, food consumption. Also, this is underpinned by different economic models beyond a neoliberal trade-oriented model. Uh, we have um, mission economics, we have donut economics, we have well-being economics nowadays. So uh, you can see a lot of diversity in where different countries want to go with their food system. And also, these different directionalities and uh, these ideas on where should future food systems uh, be heading towards, what should they look like, yeah, each uh, future food system has different implications uh, for different sustainability criteria. Uh, some will uh, perhaps exclude uh, smallholders uh, in this um, uh, in this uh, conference. There's a lot of talk, for example, I saw a presentation which was about AI and that it's perhaps uh, not very uh, pragmatic and very feasible to implement this in smallholder farming system because the supportive infrastructures are not there. Yeah, then if you fully bet on AI, you, you may exclude that group and you may favor uh, uh, large scale farmers. So that has implications, for example, for this sustainability element of just ethical and equitable food systems. I won't, you know, do a full analysis of all the different futures, but you can imagine they have different outcomes uh, within this framework, which was uh, devised by uh, Anik Having and colleagues. So what does this mean for the way we organize innovation for food systems transformation? And this brings me to the topic and the concept of AIS, Agricultural Innovation Systems. And AIS is a way of thinking about uh, the organization of agriculture innovation, uh, which uh, got its origins already in the 80s, 90s, when systems thinking came into uh, uh, agricultural innovation and how we conceptualize it, how we promote it. And this really took off in, in, in the 2000s uh, with a report by World Bank, uh, which was really saying, you know, yeah, we should consider this concept as a major concept to, to do research on innovation, to uh, uh, develop policies for innovation. And basically, the AIS concept is a recognition that all actors uh, within agri-food systems matter for innovation. It's not just the researchers producing innovations and pushing them to agriculture through agriculture extension. No, it's a co-production process in which all these actors, which you can see in these pictures on the, the slides, play a role. And you should actively engage them because uh, you encounter different problems in innovation. Uh, for example, when you introduce a technology, uh, say a tractor, but you haven't uh, thought about, you know, is this affordable? Can farmers finance this? Do you have a repair network? Uh, yeah, you need to bring into, uh, into the game all these actors that can, you know, bring in these elements, financial actors, uh, service actors, to uh, have an innovation work in practice. So... And this is a way of thinking about innovation which has become quite mainstream nowadays. And you can look at this 
uh, through different lenses, you can say, okay, what is the AIS around a certain technology which we want to develop? But you can also look much more at a structural level in a country, you know, do we have all the players there to produce agriculture innovation? Are we neglecting somebody, for example, uh, that NGOs which, uh, uh, which represent and advocate certain uh, views from groups and societies are not on the table? Well, uh, this may mean that you get resistant because you, you don't work with them. So this can give you an overview of, do we have all the players at the table in our uh, co-innovation process? So it can give you like a structural perspective. So this thinking on agricultural innovation and agricultural innovation systems has uh, evolved. Uh, um, there's different generations. Uh, I put these underneath in the slide uh, with this AIS 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. So basically, uh, like I already said, we have uh, started to see innovation as a complex uh, uh, process with multiple players. It's about this bundled innovation and you really need to bring different innovations together. Uh, and that has become uh, recognized increasingly in this uh, um, evolution from AAS 1.0 to AAS 3.0. But nowadays there's another factor and that is kind of this transformative thing, innovation for what purpose? Uh, uh, that we also really need to tackle crisis, that we really need to, you know, get out of this current situation which we have created through our earlier innovation systems. And also, we need to avoid making the mistake that we create one new future, future food systems. We also need to cater to different groups. Uh, we've had a lot of benefit, for example, from the Green Revolution, but also it has uh, uh, not provided benefits for all actors. And it also has... Uh, uh, produce negative externalities, spillovers, for example, to ecosystems. And that is this idea of this AAS 4.0, that it needs to be much more aware of those issues. It needs to uh, push transformation much harder, but also make sure that we have different pathways which suit different groups. So this I idea of mission-oriented AAS, it's a next evolution in agriculture innovation systems thinking. And it's really about uh, those actors that are really connected uh, to a complete a societal mission. And um, the idea is uh, that, that you really need to work with, with, with bigger stakeholder networks, but also really um, gear up uh, public sector support to, to be able to tackle these grand challenges. It's not just innovation for uh, improving current systems, for getting another nice gimmick out uh, for making more profit. No, it's really innovation for solving big challenges. And um, you can see uh, within the agri-food scene, yeah, all kinds of missions. You know, if you think about the CGIR, they have like digital transformation as one of their missions. They have agroecology as one of their missions. Um, the Netherlands, like I said, has this circular agriculture, circular bioeconomy as their mission. You could also say like digital transformation is a sort of mission. And so the whole system of actors that want to promote it also to tackle these grand challenges. And yeah, you could consider that a mission oriented agricultural innovation system. And yeah, I don't want to go too much into theory. Huh? That's always the risk when you have an academic talking about their work that they, uh, that they drift into all kinds of theories uh, which are really hard to grasp. But still to show the difference with earlier thinking, I, I, I put a, a picture on this slide and there uh, it's not talking about agriculture in, 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 in specific, it's talking about innovation system. So NIS is national innovation system. The TIS is technological innovation system, a system connected to developing a particular technology, say for example, electric cars. And R RIS is a regional innovation system and SIS is a sectorial innovation system, like the, the system connected to agriculture, and obviously they're cross-cutting. But this MIS, this mission-oriented innovation system, is kind of cross-cutting. Uh, the mission of digital transformation for getting new food systems is not national. It's not just one technology. It's connected to several regions, but, you know, it's about getting this mission done. That is kind of the core organizing principle. What is important to consider, and this was also on the request of the organizer that I reflected a little bit uh, on this, 
uh, is that these mission-oriented agricultural innovation systems have politics. Now, when you do transformation, when you do radical stuff, and you really want to change food systems, you will always encounter resistance. There's lots of reports which also say, you know, this is about changing power balances, uh, this is about bringing new systems into being new food systems and phasing out existing food systems. So yeah, where you have change, you have politics. And uh, also these MAIS, uh, these, these mission-oriented agriculture innovation systems, they're not without politics. And uh, there's a really nice uh, scheme uh, from uh, Melissa Leach and colleagues from uh, Institute of Development Studies in the UK, uh, talking about the politics of food systems, uh, food systems change, and they have introduced the 4D perspective, which is about directionality, diversity, distribution, and democracy. And this is a nice heuristic, a nice way, this 4D model, to yeah, really think about you know, what is important to contemplate in these mission-oriented agricultural innovation systems to have good outcomes in terms of food systems transformation. So I will uh, reflect a little bit on what would this mean for digital transformation in relation to food systems transformation. So one important consideration uh, from the 4D is diversity and directionality. So how is digital transformation done? And like I already said, digital transformation of food systems is quite a debated topic. And for some, it's really like a dream. Uh, and for others, it's a nightmare. And uh, Thomas Daum has also reflected on this, you know, what does kind of a good digital uh, future food system look like and what does kind of an evil, dark, dystopian uh, digital system look like in which machines have taken over, which is much more monocropping and uh, which we have lost as humans a connection to agriculture. And uh, yeah, it's important to contemplate, you know, what do we want? How do we want to shape future food systems through digital transformation? Is this really and having the farmer at his home sitting behind the screen? Uh, or is this still uh, working with very diverse systems which, in which humans and robots work together and in which you also have high diversity? And there's some uh, um, uh, digital actors, startups, more established firms, uh, NGOs who are working on this, like small robot company who work really on integrating small robots and highly diverse system, Light Farm, which is an open access agroecology platform. And also one of the keynote speakers, I think who will close the conference uh, has a very inclusive uh, we robotics uh, concept uh, to work with grassroots movements to really have a well adapted solutions so that we don't get dystopian futures. And also it's important, you know, what are the bigger concepts digital technologies are embedded in. This relates a little bit to the, the previous slide. Uh, digital can be very strong in creating circular systems in which animal production, uh, plant production, uh, bioeconomy as a whole, uh, different uh, resource flows are very well connected in which you have regenerative farming to improve soils. That requires a lot of measurement, a lot of connections. Well, there you could employ digital technologies and then it's connected to a larger concept. And I think you can also see it that the technology plays a role in this bigger concept of circular agriculture or circular food systems, which is now a leading concept, a leading mission in the Netherlands. Uh, also, uh, um, instead of being highly uh, polarized and saying it's either digital transformations or it's fully agroecology without any digital, you can go to kind of mixed hybrid concepts like digital agroecology. And luckily, more and more actors are seeing that these are not incompatible and they're trying to bring uh, these worlds together, for example, through concepts such as pixel farming uh, or uh, this diversity by design concepts in which uh, agricultural technologies are much better tailored to small scale, highly diverse farming, uh, so, yeah, it's important to also say, you know, what are these leading concepts, these leading missions, uh, uh, also to organize agricultural innovation systems actors to this, and also to, to see, you know, um, uh, is this network suffic sufficiently diverse? Do we need to make new connections between people who can't find each other uh, very easily? Then another D, distribution. Uh, that is about looking at the systemic effects. Uh, 
And basically, um, this is about considering uh, food systems connected with digital technologies as social cyber physical systems. Uh, in the digital transformation world, there's a lot of talk often about cyber physical systems, but there's also the social in it. And that's the human, the human in the game. And um, yeah, humans have needs, they have expectations and goals, yeah, their ambitions for future food systems. But those ambitions and when realizing them, yeah, when bringing in technologies who interact with the physical environment, with an ecological environment, yeah, the cyber, with the physical, that also interacts with the social, and there's relationship that has certain impacts. Yeah, new systems will form. And it can either uh, boost the current system, speed up processes. Uh, it can also enable new systems. It can it, it will disable current systems. It has all kinds of effects, and you need to be very aware of them because that has justice implications. Some people will be uh, positively affected. Some people will be negatively affected, and you need to monitor that to be able to counteract those negative effects. And also you can, and this is a really nice work from Mario Herrero uh, and colleagues, and you can map it against uh, the, the sustainable development goals. And they made an exercise with automation and robotics in agriculture, uh, which can have positive and negative effects. It can reinforce certain things uh, in a positive way. It can also counteract certain things. Uh, yeah, uh, and certain development goals in, the, in, this, in this context. Well, you need to really think ahead, you know, what will digital transformation of food systems imply? And also, you know, uh, what does that mean for perhaps readjusting the mission, uh, reorganizing innovation systems? This is another example from David Rose and colleagues who did this also for autonomous agriculture and robots. Uh, yeah, this has all kinds of effects uh, on, on employment, on economics. It has effects on regulation. It calls for new regulation. Uh, it's important to do these types of exercises. And here it also has, for example, effects on health and safety, sustainability environment, and not everything is positive. Uh, so, so you need to, as an innovation system, uh, employing those missions, you need to be monitoring this, uh, to, to really be aware of what is the dis distribution of effects. And then the last one, the democracy, how to organize inclusive mission arenas. Uh, so these um, uh, mission-oriented agriculture innovation systems, since they play out uh, in multiple places. If you look at digital transformation, it doesn't happen in one place. Uh, it's in connected mission arenas. Yeah, you need to organize that uh, with the right people on board. Uh, you need to, for example, have uh, advocacy organizations, critical NGOs on board to help you reflect on potentially negative effects. Well, you can do that through concepts such as living labs, responsible innovation, Andrea Gardia Sabal is organizing a panel on that. Uh, Human-centered co-design, we've seen lots of examples also during these, this conference, grassroots innovation. And so there are already lots of mission arenas working on responsible, inclusive digital transformation. So to uh, go towards the end of my presentation, um, and you can pick up this, this mission-oriented agricultural innovation systems concept uh, as a country. So I already say that the, the, the Dutch AIS, uh, it has circular agriculture, circular food systems as a, as a core organizing principle. That is the mission. That is what we want to have. And it has all kinds of goals in it. Uh, and then they are leading. They bring actors together. They form kind of a dot on the horizon. And they can also orchestrate the policies and they can uh, see where do we really need public support and where also do we need active government intervention to get out of current systems. Uh, you don't only need innovation, you also need exnovation. And here as a key enabling technologies, you see smart technologies and also digitalization is a key, has a key role to play here. Here in Chile, where I'm currently based, since I'm connected both to the University of Talca, but also still uh, in a small role connected to Wageningen University. And they're also working on missions. So uh, the Agro 5.0 uh, is yet another uh, concept. Uh, is already quite current here and is a leading concept to also transform food systems here. And they have a TT Green Foods, which really also uh, expresses, you know, we need to have green, sustainable um, programs to really reform our food system, which is highly export oriented in Chile, but it has lots of negative environmental effects. And 
uh, lots of effects of climate change, water scarcity that need to be addressed. And these are also addressed in some major overarching missions of government for all sectors like uh, just decarbonization, resilience to the climate crisis, uh, diversification of production. And so also Chile is creating a mission-oriented innovation system, uh, also in agriculture, but also in other sectors. And in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, the same is happening. Uh, they, they were one of the pioneers with the National Science Challenges, which was mission-led research. They now have, have uh, reframing New Zealand's food sector report, uh, Tipuna Wakaronui, uh, which is also saying, you know, what are the future food systems? What role does digital play in it? It sets a mission and kind of gears the system uh, towards achieving this mission. Some concluding reflections. Um, so this mission-oriented agriculture innovation concept is now taking root uh, slowly. Um, and some countries really are gearing up, you know, this, this mission-oriented agriculture innovation system. And you could call it the particularly transformation-oriented branch of the AIS. And it can be large. Some countries really put a lot of effort in it. But other countries are still innovating the agriculture sector with business as usual. Right? So that's also, it can help you assess how transformative are we. Uh, for example, um, in Europe, uh, I think they really want to have transformative uh, agriculture innovation systems, mission-oriented agriculture innovation systems. But a report has shown that the policy makers still have a long way to go to also gear up and orchestrate the policies to make this happen. And also there's really nice work from Thomas Down who has also shown that African governments are also thinking about how can we you know, change our innovation systems to be much more uh, focused on these transformative missions. And here digital transformation can be part of broader missions or it can also be a standalone mission. But I also need to say uh, both as a scholar but also in terms of how this is kind of taking root in, in the policy environment, it needs further strengthening in policy practice and science but it's a a useful tool to also look at the policy mix and to really also bring out some of the tensions, some of the power struggle that go with transformation. So if you're interested in some further reading, we put out some perspectives in agricultural systems. They're all uh, open access. Also this paper on uh, New Zealand is open access where we assess how far are they with this mission orientation. And also this uh, idea of social cyber fiscal systems as a tool and you can read about it in this paper by uh, Matteo Meta and colleagues. So um, thanks so much for your attention. Um, well, you can follow me on Twitter or X if you're interested. And uh, here are some of the references. And uh, thank you so much. And I will now uh, uh, stop sharing. OK, great. Yeah, th thanks so much for uh, this very insightful presentation and also sharing resources uh, for further reading. Um, yeah, I, I didn't mention in the beginning but uh, I mean, to the audience, if you ever studied or tried to find literature on agricultural transformation, the digital transformation, especially in ICT area, you might have, you must have already uh, cited some of the Lawrence papers. So actually, Lawrence, I, I was going through your Google Scholar page, and it goes all the way to like 20, 2003, I think, or more than 20 years you have been working on this. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it's, it's impressive. So I think there are a lot of changes happened for the last two decades, but I think in a way we are still maybe uh, kind of, you know, in the same, it's, it's, it, you, you have been using different terminology and different frameworks, but yeah, I wonder if there are still commonality where we started and you, you also introduced kind of preview of 5.0, uh, but I, I see there are still kind of overlapping complexities yeah, yeah, and, and trade-offs and all that of things. So. Yeah, so, I, so just given that, I, I just wanted to quickly ask you, uh, maybe you can reflect on your 20 years journey of tracking and studying and also formulating this uh, digital transformation and information systems transformation. Um, I, I mean, if you can share a little bit of kind of reflection on are we on track or do you see something surprising like this kind of uh, mission oriented information system, or is, is this something really you you haven't thought about, you didn't think of 20 years ago, but it's now really mm -hmm. um, being pushed to be mainstream. So yeah, I think to comparing where yeah. we are and 20 years ago, and if you can share some reflection, I think it'll be very yeah, uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think 
with this mission-oriented agricultural innovation system concept, we have become very explicit on transformative goals. Now, obviously, innovation has always transformed agriculture. But now, I think we are much more aware of we need to transform quickly. We need to gear up for it. And we really need to kind of go beyond business as usual. Uh, uh, and we also need to be aware that you know, innovation has a normative goal. And it's not just for uh, raising economic uh, uh, well-being. It's also an important goal. But you also need to uh, make sure that it works for non-humans, uh, for ecosystems, for animals, for plants. Um, you also need to be much more explicit about, like I said in my presentation, that there's not one recipe. I think that is something we learned from previous innovation, huh? uh, perhaps previous missions. Huh? I think in the 60s, 70s, we had the mission, huh? no hunger anymore, increasing productivity, the Green Revolution was a very noble mission but it hasn't worked for all. So I think we have learned that missions are important, but we need to perhaps see which mission works for whom, or that we need to create some diversity within that mission. I think that is some, 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 some changes in thinking or we have a greater awareness of it. Um, but, I, but, but, but like I said, it's, it's, it's an evolution of the concepts. It's not that like linear perspectives don't work. Sometimes you have a very well-working technology and you just need to diffuse it. Uh, sometimes uh, um, the, 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 the innovation systems concepts had uh, the previous generation, the 3.0, also talked a lot about co-innovation and doing it together with stakeholders. That hasn't changed. So some elements have changed, but some is just the same. It's, it's like part of a learning process, basically. Uh, but um, yeah, I do see that this awareness of, of transformation, also power and politics has become much more... Um, yeah, obvious also in debates and, and also in policy circles. So I think that is perhaps a change which I've seen in these 20 years. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so actually speaking of policy and policy makers, um, yeah, I wonder if, yeah, how they might, you know, kind of internalize this. I mean, yeah, obviously the mission oriented can be uh, interpreted at different levels and different scales. Uh, at country level, you can set like decarbonization of economy as a mission, but in reality, when you go mm -hmm. down to different communities, a different sector and different value chains, there might be mm -hmm. some prioritization need to be made and, and trade-off yeah. might also need to be analyzed that there must be winners and losers and because some sectors might have been, um, you know, just analyze as a carbon emitter, too much carbon coming out of this sector, or maybe countries need to make some adjustment on their ecosystem and the economy. So mm -hmm. I mean, is there some kind of analytical framework to help policymakers to, you know, to be on the framework, but also kind of putting some numbers or values uh, to, to help them prioritize mm -hmm. on the different pathways uh, in the future? Yeah, the future? yeah, 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 definitely. Well, I think what is important with the mission framework is that the mission needs to be concrete enough. Yeah? Um, mm -hmm. So you can have like very open missions like reducing high carbon emissions, which is a very good goal, but it's too intangible. It doesn't help people to envision this is what uh, my food system in 2050 looks like. So you need to create some concepts which work. So like the circular food systems thing, you know, it's kind of a, it, 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 it makes people connect to something it, it helps you know um, uh, orient investments it helps thinking about what are the sorts of technologies we should use and the bundles we need to create as uh, speaking in Chris Barrett's uh, concept um, so that that is one important thing and I think then that uh, this if you, if you once you have like the mission and the form it should have established then you can say okay this is something we were really lacking of and we don't have like the, the key enabling technologies, we should gear up investment on that. Or uh, we are working a lot of creating new alternative systems, but we are not really making the current systems less attractive. And so, for example, if you say our goal is to have like 50% plant based foods, uh, um, uh, there is a clear mission it needs to taste good it needs to look good you need to have demand for it it needs to be embedded in food culture uh, that can help on working on different elements to realize that food system uh, vision 
but you also need to work on, you know, like I said, exnovating the current system. So perhaps you need higher taxation for meat. And you need to say, okay, we, we can have livestock because it's important, but we want it through these sorts of integrated systems with these environmental uh, parameters and sustainability indicators. And then you can kind of gear your policies on that and you can create a policy mix. And I think um, if you talk about analytical tools, well, uh, uh, policy mix analysis, uh, are all the policy mixes coherent, consistent, complementary? Uh, the report I put on my slides of the EU food system shows there's, they want something, but their policies are not helping doing it. So it can help you kind of make a critical analysis of you need to really convert your policies or you need to get rid of some older policies. It can help like that. Um, you can also um, use kind of this framework to keep track of developments. I think that is also what the ATIO, the Agricultural Technology Innovation Indicators Initiative, which FAO is now also developing and which came uh, out of the work from uh, Cornell, uh, Chris Barrett, Mario Herrero. I think that's also a good way of monitoring, you know, how are these missions evolving? Are we seeing more technologies, more mature firms? Do we see more take up? Do we see uh, yeah, overall change. We see change in discourses of the public also. And so, yeah, it's a multi-indicator model, basically, to assess emission. Right, exactly. So, yeah, I, I would imagine this will really require a yeah, multi-sector, um, multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. approach to be, uh, to, to, to get to the consensus. Um, like, just speaking of that, uh, speaking of which, uh, yeah, I, I think you also kind of emphasized in previous research on the uh, importance of having trust uh, in this innovation mm -hmm. system. The data governance, uh, so innovation system itself, uh, but also use of the innovation in, in a mm -hmm. more beneficial way for different stakeholders, etc. Uh, can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about uh, maybe where trust come in for this ever, <laughs> it's, it's getting a little bit more complicated, uh, the blurry boundaries of different actors yeah. and uh, and yeah, yeah. innovation systems, uh, how we ensure the trust is still a building block of a foundational building block yeah, of yeah, all yeah, these different yeah, elements. Yeah. Well, I think with, with mission oriented innovation systems, trust building is very important because, like I said, it's often highly contested what the food system should look like. And mm -hmm. you really need to get kind of an honest dialogue between stakeholders also where, where will it hurt when we transform. So you need to build trust for that. Um, and I think that can sometimes be harder because you'll perhaps also bring together groups that are not really familiar with each other, like ag tech and food tech startups with farmers, with uh, uh, researchers in very classical research institutes. They don't speak each other's language, so you need to build to trust them. I also think that these new technologies also have a direct impact on trust. So, for example, digital technologies like AI, it's about trust in the AI, but also you know, how does, does AI and other digital technology change trust relationships between people in food systems? For example, blockchain is basically a tool to make trust uh, not needed anymore. Um, there are some kind of real-time tracking uh, supply chain technologies, which also, you know, work on uh, reducing uh, um, certain um, actors in the chain uh, so that they're not needed anymore. Yet it also changes the relationships and trusts in networks and people start to distrust each other. Do you want that imp to implement that technology to get me out of the loop and make me lose my livelihood? So, you know, there's a whole new trust dynamic. It's digital transformation creates new trust dynamics. You need trust to be able to do it. And it's kind of a reciprocal relationship. So it, it changes trust in multiple ways. Yeah, it's a complex subject. But I think you need good facilitators to help people, you know, get into grips with digital transformation and, and make, make them view, okay, what will happen? Uh, what will be the effects, the boosting effect, the depleting effect, and how can we counteract it? So you also need to create trust that you will address the injustices that may arise. And I think that is important in these processes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I've, I've been also thinking back of my mind, uh, what kind of research, next research kind of topic could come from uh, from this uh, MAIS. Uh, maybe yeah, we can build something around trust and how we ensure trust is building um, mm -hmm. yeah, into yeah. this. 
Okay, great. And, and just also personally, I, I wanted to mention uh, when you mentioned digital agroecology, I was really happy to hear that uh, currently within CGIR portfolio, the agroecology program and digital are not necessarily uh, kind of compatible uh, just by design of it. But yeah, I think uh, you kind of uh, presented a way we can be more collaborative. Yeah, Sorry yeah. for my dogs <laughs> barking behind me. Um, no, no so yeah, we, we have just <laughs> we have just a few more minutes. Uh, so yeah, if you have any kind of last uh, remark or comment uh, before we close, uh, we will appreciate it. Well, like I, like I said, you know, the, 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 the mission-oriented agriculture innovation systems concept um, is kind of an next iteration. Uh, like I said, I think I would be really happy if people pick it up, both in kind of the policy scene, but also uh, more from an academic or innovation support actor uh, perspective to see, you know, how can we make this work and how can we make sure that it also helps really addressing food systems transformation issues and, and, and make our innovation systems better work for transformative research and innovation instead of business as usual and incremental improvement. So that would be great if people would pick it up and um, yeah, let's see what happens in the future. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think it will be picked up. Uh, I think this is very clear kind of framework uh, that had a lot of potential to be useful and just yeah, moving people for the yeah next generation of transformation. So, okay, great. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks so much for your uh, presentation and sharing insight. Uh, it's been yeah really a pleasure. Uh, it's really, really great. Um, so we will close this uh, session. Yeah. That, uh, thanks, Lawrence. Um, so today, audience, our next session will be another block of lightning talk, I believe. Uh, let me scroll down. down. Yeah. Um, so you know, you know the drill. Uh, so if you are in Zoom, uh, you need to kind of end the Zoom webinar and go back to lobby and find the lightning talk session on, on the menu. Yeah, or if you're already in the lobby, uh, it will be automatically loaded in one minute. Um, so we will see you there. So enjoy the rest of the day or rest of the agenda. And I will see you again in some other sessions.